Okay, scripture reading for today is Mark 4, 3, 3 through 8. Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprung up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. So be it. You know what a privilege it is to have the breath of life? You know, that song talked about Jesus being our breath. I mean, he is. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Without him, there would not be any existence. Just stop breathing for a minute. I don't know about you, but I don't want to keep doing that for too long. Every breath I take is because God loved me and created me and wants a relationship with me. If you haven't been reading along in this, these were some words that you should have read yesterday. God showed us how much a soul is worth by the purchase price he paid. It cost him dearly, and that which is so hard won will not be easily given up. He spent his son's blood to purchase you, and he will spend his own power to keep you. He loves us so much, and the world has no idea. They think this life is simply about whatever the chips may be, you know, when it's said and done, he who dies with the most toys wins, whatever the, the, their mentality is. But if you know Jesus Christ, then you know you were created to bring glory and honor to God. That every breath you have is for his purpose. So you need to come to him with arms wide open, gracefully broken every single day so that we realize that our life is not our own, but it is a gift of God. And if we've been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, then what can we do for the kingdom each and every day? We're going to talk about that a little bit today in our text from this week's reading. But let's start with prayer first. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you that you would choose to create us, knowing that it would cost your son's life. Lord, that you want a relationship with us, that you will do so many wonderful things to keep us safe and secure if we will only put our faith, our hope, and our trust in you rather than in created things. Father, we thank you that you are perfect, righteous, holy. We just thank you and praise you that we can come here and worship you today. We pray for safe travel, and we pray for those, Lord, that are a lot less fortunate and those that don't know the word. May we be a light to this world. May we go out boldly and joyfully proclaim the message that we say that we believe and live a life that proves it. We just thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So, Barb, you finished your reading, did you not, for your Bible last year? Then come here. You missed last week is why. And I gave each one a chronological Bible. Were you here, Catherine? I was here, but I was not there. Did you get yours? Then you get up here too. You're not alone, see? <laughs> okay. This is a wow, New yeah. Living Testament chronological order, my gift for you. Well, thank you very much. Because I am so proud. Yeah. And there is yours. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You finished yet? Get up here. <laughs> Terry got a little bit behind because he had eye surgery and stuff, so he finished as well. I knew he was close. If anybody else does, didn't get a Bible, tell me so that I don't miss you. Okay? 
I entitled this message, One Seed. Because when you think about one itty-bitty little seed, can that really make a difference? Well, let's find out. But you bet your bottom dollar it does. What can you do with one seed? Think about that as we're reading along. You should have read Matthew through Matthew chapter 8 this week. You're halfway through the book of Mark. You'll see a difference here where Jesus is telling them from this point on to declare who he is. Now, who is he telling that to? He's not telling it to the crowds anymore. He's telling it to his disciples. To just a few disciples, as a matter of fact, a handful. Not just 12. There were more than the 12. And we know that there were even thieves and liars amongst them. That not everyone who proclaims to know Jesus truly knows Jesus. They have other motives, whatever they are. But he's gone from the massive crowds at chapter 8 to this intimate teaching and everything. But we're going to go back a little bit before we get there. We're going to go back to Mark chapter 3 and start. Last week you read the ending verses of Mark chapter 3, verse 33 to 35. Who are my mothers and my brothers? Jesus asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, those closest to him, not the ones further, the ones that were seated close to him, here are my mother, my brothers, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now, you know, that was probably offensive to some of the other people, especially his family, because they're the ones that prompted this conversation because they were trying to come see Jesus, but they had just before that tried to take hold of him and say, sit down, you're nuts, you're making a spectacle out of yourself. Because they didn't believe he was who he said he was, even though the mighty miracles proclaimed. Because, let's face it, if I had a brother, it'd be hard for me to believe he was the Messiah. Put yourself in their shoes. But Jesus fulfilled all of the prophecies that were foretold about him, or he will fulfill them all as you've read, because some of them he will fulfill when he comes again. He did mighty works. He lived a sinless life. He proved that he was who he said he was, so that when he did die on the cross for our sins, God's wrath was satisfied once and for all. That means that you and I don't have to worry. We can have the peace that surpasses all understanding that all of our sins have been covered by the blood of the Lamb. Up to this point, he's, not, he's telling people not to tell who he is, though, because they're still comprehending, who is this Jesus? Where do I fit into this relationship with him? Because even if I think he's the Messiah, I think he's coming now to set up his reign now, to drive the Romans out. I think in my perspective, because God's perspective is not my perspective, I have to deny myself, take up my cross to follow after Jesus. To learn that God's perspective is what matters. His will be done and His kingdom come. So I have to keep reminding myself that mine has to be in tune with Him. And Jesus is clear. I don't care who you physically are by birth. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, that is my brother, mother, sister. But what about that verse in John 3, 16 that says, Whoever believes, right? And that verse in Romans 10, 13, it says, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, see, you've got to put all that together. That's why we read and study God's Word. We can't take just those one or two verses and take them out of context. Because before John 3, 16 came, Jesus talking to Nicodemus says, Unless a man is born again, that means that you die to this old sinful nature so that you are a new creation, born again by the Spirit so that you can live a life that brings glory and honor to God. When you realize who you are and you repent of your former ways, you change your thought process to change your heart so that you will be a new creation in Christ, then if you call upon the name of the Lord, everyone who does that, they'll be saved. Because Jesus clearly said here, whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. And John 10, 27 and 28 reconfirm that. They say, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. 
There are so many out there that say they be, that they believe in Jesus, but they're like the crowds of that day. They want salvation, but they don't want a Lord. They don't want to give up their life. It's going to cost them something, and that's where they put the dividing line. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus was clear then. They're lost. When the day comes, they will be separated and put with the goats for all eternity. So it is our, should be our heart's desire, it is our goal, it is our mission to go and preach and teach the gospel message, to train up disciples so that they won't depart from the ways of the Lord. Are you doing God's will? And are you following Jesus? If he was sitting down at the dinner table with you today, what would he say to you? Would he say, this is my brother, this is my sister? Would he say that to you? If he wouldn't say that to you, then John 3.16 has no relevance to you. Jesus had many so-called followers. The crowds were getting enormous, but they weren't followers at all. They were fans. They didn't mind being associated with Jesus. It even cost them something. They traveled for days. When you read this week, you read about the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. When Jesus fed the 4,000, He said, I have compassion on these people. They've been with me for days. So they had followed Him around and everything. They thought they wanted Jesus. But not when Jesus made statements like this. To deny yourself, take up your cross and follow after me. And if you put your hand to the plow and then look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. These are the things that Jesus taught, and then we'll see more of as we read the, the next few chapters. Jesus came to be both Savior and Lord. When He offers salvation to you, you have to realize that He is your Lord, that every breath that I first talked about is because God loves you and wills you to be His child forever and ever. And if He would go to the cost that it would to, to sacrifice His only Son to save you, then look what He's going to do to keep you, just like that devotion said. If Jesus, is not your, if Jesus is not your Lord, He is not your Savior. So in Mark chapter 4, starts out this way in verse 1. It says, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large. Well, we don't know exactly what that means, but we've got some idea. He fed 5,000 men. That implies that there were probably 12, 13,000 people at that. He fed 4,000 men. That means that there was probably around 10,000 people there. These were large crowds. And at this point, Mark says that this was a very large crowd. It was so large that he got into a boat and sat in out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore on the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables, and in his te teachings he said. Now, if you're not there, turn to Mark 4, because that's where I'm going to be for 20 verses, so you'll know where I'm at. Verse 2 has two different Greek words for taught or teaching. He taught them. That means that he had the authority to do that. They recognized him as being a teacher, as being one from God, as one being knowledgeable in the Scriptures. So they came to hear him. And then the next word says, and in his teachings he said, now these means that this is Jesus' teaching, his viewpoint, his authority, because he has it on what Scriptures say. And he starts out with a parable. Well, what is a parable? A parable is a further teaching illustration, but if you look, you don't know what he's really taught here. You've got a parable, but it's not really alongside any teaching. So you have to think, what has Jesus been teaching? He's been teaching them that He is the Messiah. He's been claiming that. He's been teaching them that their lives are not their own. He's been teaching them so many different things. All eyes were on Jesus. And He starts telling them this story about a farmer. Now, you've got to put yourself into the crowd of that day, the time period, everything else, for this to make sense more. There's no John Deere tractor. There's a single farmer with precious seed that he is taking out and hand-planting one by one. Now, this seed meant life. 
Because seed, one wheat seed, which is probably what it was, one grain seed will produce many seeds. It's what they used to make their bread to, 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 that they would live off of. If you notice from the from scriptures, they had a diet there in the land of fish and bread. Without this seed developing, they would not have bread to feed their family. And we can say many things about the fish too and how many times they went out and didn't catch anything. And that's why they call it fishing instead of catching and all these things, right? But the bread, if they planted a crop and took care of it, then more than likely, unless there was a famine in the land or whatever, that it would produce a, a crop. The power was in the life of the seed. We don't know how or anything else, but it's in the life of the seed. We know that when we plant it in the ground, by faith, something is going to come up. So the farmer went out and planted one seed by seed by seed. Now, picturing that, and the crowd with all eyes fixed on Jesus... Wondering what he's going to say, and he hasn't really taught anything. He just starts out with this story. He says, a farmer goes out and does what? Well, he would never throw his seed on the path. That would be wasteful. He would make sure that he removed every rock from the ground so that there was deep soil. He would have went through and weeded all the weeds out so they wouldn't have choked the life out of the plants, correct? But that's not what Jesus says here. <clears throat> he has driven out demons... And demons listen to him. He has called men to leave their occupations, and men have left and followed him. So what is he trying to tell the crowd here? Seed should produce a crop that sustains life. Now, without going any further, you would have that recollection that day, that understanding about seed. So he got out on the water's edge and he said, Listen! Sorry, Marianne. Listen up. Listen to this story that I'm going to tell you. A farmer went out to sow his seed. Now, all that background in mind. All right, let's, let's hear this story. So the story that Jesus is going to tell is audacious, wasteful, scandalous, confusing, because it didn't fit what they thought in their mind again that a farmer should do. Okay, so now let's read it. Verse 4, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Yep, that's what we know would happen. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. All wasteful losses I've lost the precious seed that gives me life, literal, physical life, and sustains my family as well. Still other seed fell on good soil that came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Well, now that's what's supposed to happen. And I can't tell what the harvest is going to be. I just know there's going to be a harvest. And if I'm talking about a, gr a grain like a wheat seed again, I know that the harvest is exponentially. So that's what I should have if I am a farmer going to plant. So why did Jesus tell about these other three types? What did he mean? Of course, you're going to notice from the story that there's four soil types, and that's what you're going to get when you get to most commentaries. And yes, the soil type should represent your heart, and you should only have good, fertile soil. If you come to Jesus with childlike faith, with no underst other understanding except a parable, a, a teaching illustration, you should realize that the only one of those scenarios that made any sense that mattered was the one that produced the harvest. If you're out, all eyes fixed on Jesus, trying to figure out if he, who He says He is, if He's cast out demons and they obey Him, if 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 he's called men and they obey him, whatever things he's mighty, wonderful things he's done, then what should you do? Should you obey him? And should you be willing to die so that you can live for him and produce a crop? Especially if that seed means life to you and your family and their family and their family and their family. This is what Jesus is teaching them. 
<clears throat> a lavish story of a farmer going out and wasting precious seed. Made no sense except for the fourth one, why he would do that. But you see, God sows his word to everyone so that they may believe. The soil types on every one of those could be changed so that they would produce a crop. The power is in the seed. The soil has to be made ready to accept the seed so that it will produce life. The crowds claimed allegiance to Jesus, but they didn't give him allegiance. Verse 9, Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Well, if they were there, they had ears to hear. They were listening, at least they thought they were listening, but were they? They understood that they should produce a crop, but were they willing to let Jesus till the soil so the, rock, so the path wasn't packed? Would they let Jesus take out the rocks and remove them from the surface so their roots could grow deep? Would they let him pull any weeds or handle the weeds on his own and grow side by side and not worry about the weeds, get the nutrition that they need because they've let their roots grow deep? Or would they just say, yep, seed should produce a crop. I'm fine. I'll go back home and I'm all good because I know who Jesus is, but I'm not intimate with him. Because if that's the relationship you have with Jesus, John 3.16 means nothing to you. Those who are Jesus' friends, his relatives, are the ones who do the will of his Father in heaven. <clears throat> Verse 10, when he was alone, the twelve and the others, so there was more there than just the twelve, there, these are the people that have committed themselves to Jesus. This is his intimate circle. The twelve and the others around him asked about this parable. He told them the secret or the mysteries you're... you're uh, translation may have, or hidden things of the kingdom of God have been given to you. Now let's break that sentence apart a second. You've got something that was hidden, something you kept hidden for whatever reason, belonging to the kingdom of God. Ooh, no way I'm going to understand this unless it's revealed to me because I can't get to God. Something that was formerly kept secret but now has been told to me for some reason. It's been given as a gift. I couldn't have asked and got it anything else. It was just given to me. Why? Because if the secrets to the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, they've been given to you to share. Just like this crop. To let it be exponential to tell others, do you know what Jesus Christ has done for me? I was once lost, but now I am found. I was once blind, but now I see. I once could not hear and understand, but now I understand. And I know that I'm supposed to produce a crop. And I will let God tell me, remove the rocks. I'll let him worry about the reeds. I let him have the power living through me as I die to produce a crop so that I can feed my family. So that they'll get the nourishment that they need, not for physical nourishment, but spiritual nourishment. This is what Jesus is saying this day, and so many people have no idea what he's saying then, and they still don't now. Even though they profess their allegiance to Jesus. But the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you if in fact you are doing your Father's will, if you are producing a crop, if you are telling others, if you're letting your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And then don't worry about it whether you're producing 30, 60, 100, it doesn't matter. What matters is that you're growing and producing. But to those on the outside, on the outside, those are the ones that are on the inside, they're on the outside. They don't belong to Jesus. They belong to the devil. Everything is said in parables. So they're forever scratching their heads, saying, what does this story mean about farming? I don't get it. 
No, the verse says in verse 12, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. So they go home at the end of the day and say, that was a good sermon and go right back to where nothing changed, nothing impacted the soil of their lives. I'm going to do exactly what I did before. Even though I, that was a good message and, 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 and I kind of heard something speak to me and, and it was on forgiving my brother and I, and I hate that guy down the road, but I'm okay. Whatever it may be. What's the next part of that verse? Otherwise. That's a but for you the guys that don't get it. But they might have turned and been forgiven. They might truly believe instead of just saying they believe. They might be a brother, a sister, a mother, a relative, a friend of Jesus. Verse 13, then Jesus said to them, this is his 12 plus the others. This is the intimate ones. And here's what he's saying. Don't you understand this parable? Now that's inflection I put. I don't know if Jesus did it exactly that way, but he's got to be getting a little perturbed with them. He's done all these miracles and everything and still, hello, do you hear me? If you don't understand this, how then will you understand any parable? If you don't understand that you're supposed to produce a harvest, then how are you going to ever understand to love your enemy? You never will. You need to worry about producing the harvest. And guess what? You don't have to worry about that because God is the farmer who planted the seed. The power is in the seed. All you need to be is receptive soil. That's your job. And He'll do everything through you. What a mighty, wonderful God we serve. The huge crowds were out there saying, hmm, what does this parable mean? I understand that a seed should produce, but I don't get anything else. Because they weren't willing to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow after Him. They didn't understand that every breath that comes out of their mouth is because God gave it to you. What are you going to do with Jesus' explanation of this parable? In Matthew 13, 16, and 17, it says, But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it, and to hear what you hear but did not hear it. Wow! This is who we belong to if in fact we are brothers and sisters with Christ. The secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been revealed to you and I so that we can produce a crop. Here's Jesus' explanation starting in verse 14. The farmer sowed the word. There's so much there. Jesus was the word. He became flesh and dwelt among us. This is the word. The word lives in us. The word is sanctified and made holy through our understanding, through the Holy Spirit. All these things. The farmer sowed that word. Some people are like the seed upon the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Now, I don't know if you notice from that, and I don't know what your translation says, but it says sown in them. That's what it means. Wait a minute. It didn't penetrate the soil. It just laid on top, and Satan took it away, or the birds came and ate it. But God sowed that seed in your heart. Your heart was hardened so that it would not accept it. It's not his fault it didn't penetrate your hard heart. Verse 16, others like seed sown in rocky places, they hear the word and receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecutions come because of the word, because of their faith, they quickly fall away. They want this Jesus, but when it costs them something, then the truth comes out and I fall away. <clears throat> Still others, verse 18, like seed sown among thorns, they hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, 
and the desire for other things. Those things come in. Paul even said, if it wasn't for thou shalt not covet these desires for other things. These things come in and they choke out the word. What's the word? The seed. The seed is what produces the harvest, which brings life to you and to our family. It chokes it out, making it unfruitful. Wow, that, it didn't say that it produced a weak harvest. It said it was unfruitful. That one for me is kind of hard to fathom. Because I think even in those time periods, between the choking there was some life and some seeds produced for food, wasn't there? I, I don't know. You can take that home and study that one all you want to. I just know what the scripture says. It says it was unfruitful, whatever that means. Maybe it didn't produce enough. Maybe it didn't produce at all. But it tells me that it's unfruitful. I don't want any part of those. Verse 20, others like seed sown in good soil where the heart was receptive. That's all that needed to happen because then they became a new creation in Christ. They became like a little mustard seed and grew up large where birds could come and perch and feed. Like seed sown on good soil, they hear the word, they accept it, and produce a crop. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. Now, do you know from reading this that this is in parallel passages also? Luke only says 100. I, I contemplate that. He doesn't even give the other so that you don't even focus on how much each one. Just focus on doing everything for Jesus. And I can see Luke writing it that way. But God has sown seed, the Word. That's why Jesus became flesh and blood and lived among us and died for us and rose again so that our lives would not be our own that they would be His, and He could produce a mighty, mighty harvest in us. So the only problem in this parable is the soil, right? So as we're listening to this, we've got to take it to ourselves and apply it personally out there. Am I willing this day, when Jesus presents this message to me, to let Him make that soil of my heart good? to till it, to take the rocks out of it, to do whatever he pleases with the weeds. And the reason I say that with the weeds is because you have a, a different parable that says to leave the weeds until judgment day. So I don't want to say just pull the weeds. I'll let you process that. Let him deal with the weeds. Because yes, some of them are going to grow beside. Some of them may get pulled out. But it's his problem to deal with the weeds again. You're to produce a harvest. In Matthew's account, it records a parable about an enemy who plants the weeds. That's where you'll find that one. And the reason that the weeds are planted is to suck the life out of your plant so that you don't produce a harvest. Remember that. So all these times you're saying, oh, that's fine, I can still hang out with this person over here. I know they do these things, but they won't infect me. Bull. Iron sharpens iron as long as it's made to sharpen. When it's banging against, it dulls. You think you can just go into these other environments and not be affected by it? I say you probably can't. But I know what James says. He says to flee from evil. He says to tell the devil to leave and he will flee from you. Jesus said when he went to the cross in John 12 that he was taking victory, that he was removing the power from Satan. The power of the penalty of sin and the power of sin in your life today. He told us to live lives to be perfect like our heavenly Father was perfect. And he said unless a grain of seed fall to the ground and dies, it cannot produce a harvest. In Luke, Luke's account does not give the varying seeds. Here's what it says in Luke 8, 15, or the varying harvest. 
But the seed on the good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, that's why I wanted to say that, it's not easy. You have to be patient, steadfast, consistent, and enduring. All those words can be put in there for persevering so that you will produce a crop. If you keep on reading in Mark 4, verse 21 through 25, he said to them, Do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or bed? No, of course not. See, he's still not giving them any teaching. He's just going into another parable. He's told this about this harvest, and they're scratching their head on why would this farmer plant the seed like he did, but that's not the point. The point is it should produce a harvest. So if it should produce a harvest, do you bring a lamp and put it under a bowl? If you realize that it's supposed to produce a harvest, then why would you not put it out for the world to see? Why would you take what you've learned today and said, I understand this, and I'm going to go back and read and study my Bible, but I'm not going to proclaim the word to others. Then it'd be just like a doctor that goes and gets his doctorate to save people's lives and then never saves a life, right? That's just stupid. Does anyone bring a lamp and put it under a bowl or bed? No. They put it out where it gives light so others can see. Instead, don't you put it on a stand? Verse 22, For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out in the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. He says it again. I'm warning you, listen carefully to what I am saying. Don't just listen to this and say that was a good message and put it aside. Listen to it and let it impact your heart so that it changes your soil of your heart and you produce a harvest. Jesus wasn't done there though. Verse 24, he said, Consider carefully what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Maybe in this world, maybe in the world to come, but I guarantee you Jesus' words will have validity to them. Every single one. Verse 25, Whoever has, has will be given more. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them. If the seed is meant to produce life and you don't use the seed for the harvest, then you're having life removed from you and your family. Maybe it means more when you put it that way. Jesus came to sow life. Not just so that you'd have eternal life, but that you'd have abundant life. Not the so you just have peace, but so that you'd have peace that surpasses all understanding. I entitled this message, One Seed. Now think about that again. What one little seed could produce through, your, through you, through your heart. The most common seed in Jesus' day was wheat. Do you know how much one seed of wheat produces? How about you, Barry? He came from Kansas is why I'm asking because you've got a lot of crops in Kansas, some wheat fields and stuff. You know, you've seen pictures. You, might, you can probably even see the plant, but there's a little st stalk that comes up and then there's a pod and it's got seed or, or kernels on it and then there's another pod, right? Well, here's the answer if you just Google it. On average, there are 22 seeds per head and five heads per plant. That's 110 seeds. Jesus said 30, 60, 100. I'm not worried about his math. What I'm thinking about is 1 and 110. If I let him plant the power of his word through my life, if I let him give good soil to my heart, then there could be 110 seed pods come off of that. Wow! Wow! Let him till your heart. Let his words impact you. Don't be like the crowds that just go home and say, I heard some about Jesus today. He's a good speaker. He's a good teacher. Yeah, I believe in him. Let him be Lord of your life. Let him turn you into a new creation. Let him give you peace. Just think of the disciples themselves. They don't know at this point, and as you're reading, especially from Mark's writing through Peter's perspective, Peter doesn't have a clue. But 
he gets up and boldly proclaims the word of God, gives up everything he has. Even after he goes back to fishing, you know, after Jesus is crucified and everything. But when he realizes it and he lets the power of the Spirit live through him, God uses him mightily. And how many souls are saved on that day of Pentecost when he gets up and stands and proclaims? Wow. With what can you do with one seed? A lot. Matthew 13, 30. That's what I'm going to close with. These are Jesus' words again. He's talking about weeds. And he's talking about the true plants. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters. First, collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Don't let the enemy rob your life with the weeds. If we were honest, most of us fall into that category. We've weathered the shallow times and we're here at church and we've been more faithful. We're here in the first place. Our, our soul's not hard. Our heart's not hardened. But we're still fighting that battle that spiritual battle that again Paul said, why do I do the things that I choose not to do? Any that you're letting those weeds suck life out of you, you're taking away from God's harvest. The enemy has no power, no dominion in your life. Get rid of him. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for Jesus' words. We thank you for this church family. We thank you that you would send your son to die for our sins and then, then you would empower us by the power of your spirit to live. May we bind together and use the gifts that the spirit gives us to build up this body of Christ to serve you with all of our hearts. To lean not under our own understanding but to lean to you, Father. To be strengthened by one another. To, build our to use our words to build up rather than tear apart. And may we hold together patiently, meet together, longing for the day when Jesus Christ returns. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the precious blood of Jesus that covers all of our sin and shame and seals us as your own. We pray this in his precious name. Amen.